I want to talk about this phrase that I said a lot of today, and that's don't let the size of your portfolio dictate how you trade, but rather let how you trade dictate the size of your portfolio. I'm still seeing too many of you find limitations as reasons to not succeed. Uh, maybe it's pattern day trading. That seems to be a common one. You don't want to trigger the day trades. Maybe it's, you know, you have school or something, or you have a job, or you can't make the open, you can't make the close, et cetera, et cetera. You're noticing all these limitations. And that is just a simple mindset that you have to change. You can be aware of your limitations, but they can't dictate how you trade, okay? And if you allow that to happen because you think you're protecting yourself, really all you're doing is you're hurting yourself. And you might have some success, you might have some failures, you know, you'll have some ups and downs, but you won't really learn about who you are because if you develop these habits based on these limitations, okay, and you just so should happen to have some success, what you're doing is you're laying the groundwork for a successful career based on limitations. So you'll get really good at, you know, circumstantial trading, what I call being put in difficult situations and still making the most of it. Maybe that's not being able to trade the opens. Maybe that's not being able to trade more than three day trades a week. You'll get good at that, and that's, that's cool, all right? That's all well and good. But what you really should be focused on is developing habits now that in the future, if you get to where you want to be, I would imagine most of us want to have a trading career that isn't barred down by limitations. I mean, is that, is that fair to say? Most of you who have jobs, you have your 9 to 5, or maybe you're in school, or maybe you're under 25,000. I think the reason all of us are here is because we want to get somewhere be it with our trading career or just in our lives personally. Okay, I think that's fair to say. And therefore, if that is your desire, then the habits you're developing now have to be the habits that would be consistent with when that desire can come to fruition. Because if you just so happen to get into a fortunate enough stance where you're able to not have so many limitations, what's going to happen is the strategy that will have gotten you there is going to be different than the one that's really going to take you to the next level and you'll struggle. You'll, for, you'll forever struggle to get to that next level. All right. Uh, so I have this copy and pasted on my home page. I see it a lot. I don't care how big or how small your portfolio is, it is not what should be dictating how you trade. How you trade is what should be dictating the size of your portfolio. All right. First question. Can you explain what it means to have a bias and how put or call premium can help you formulate that bias? This is a good question. I know a lot of times people will see me in chat say that I have a bullish bias or a bearish bias and I'm expecting this, I'm expecting that, okay? And just simply what that means is it's just an expectation. Bias is another, is kind of one of those buzzwords I use to help formulate an expectation. If I have a, if I have a bullish bias, I'm going to form you know, bullish expectations, and then if what plays out doesn't fall in line with those bullish expectations, then I'm going to have to question if my bias was correct, okay? And if my bias is incorrect, then I'm going to have to change my expectations, change my strategy, et cetera, et cetera. But if the price action starts proving my bias to have been correct, now I can kind of lean into my expectations, okay? Now what I mean by that phrase, lean in, 
I can become more confident. It's like hitting a couple shots in a row. Okay, you made one, you made two. Now, now you're feeling good about making three. You make three, now you're feeling good about making four. Whereas if you miss a lot in a row, all you're trying to do is make one. Okay, and I think it's very important to have a bias. You want to have expectations. I, I talk about friends a lot. You have friends and family in your life. You have certain expectations about those people in your life. You know that one of your friends is a good listener, and you can talk to him or her about certain things that you can't talk to them about other things, right? So maybe there's something serious going on that you need to talk to them about, and you try and talk to them about it, and, you know, your bias is to talk to that particular person, okay? If Joe Blow is the person you always go to, when you have some shit come up in your life, your bias is to go talk to Joe Blow because you expect him to understand and, and kind of be there for you, etc. And now if you go talk to him and he is doing, you know, he's supporting your bias and he's being forthcoming with what you're saying, now maybe you're going to open up a little bit more. You're going to tell him even more about what's on your mind. But if he's maybe standoffish and you're kind of surprised that, it's not what you're used to, and maybe he doesn't seem like he wants to hear about it. Now you're not going to tell him everything else. You know what I'm saying? So stocks are the same way. You want to come up with these biases that now you can come up with, you can shape your expectations, and then based on what they do, now you can adjust your strategy and your expectations. Remember, there's nothing wrong with adjusting a strategy that's based on expectations. There is something wrong with adjusting a strategy for the hell of it, okay? So that's my explanation of, of a bias. Now, as far as how can put or call premium help you formulate that bias? This is a good, good little lead-in because we have a lot of options questions today. Well, the first thing we need to know when formulating a bias. One of the first parts about a bias or an expectation is how big do we expect the move to be in either direction, right? So if I'm going to if I'm going to formulate a, a short bias, how overly aggressive am I going to make my expectation? You know, deep to the downside, or is it only going to be a 1%, 2%, or are we talking 10%, okay? So based on, on that, on what I posed, that question, how big do we expect the move to be in either direction, how might put or call premium help us in making that determination? What are some ideas that we might have in regards to put and call premium? Just call them out. Again, I want to know what you guys think with how put or call premium can help us formulate this expectation of how big a move might be in either direction. Let me put it another way. If there is a lot of premium baked in to the options, what is that telling you about the stock? Yes, trade one has, has the right answer that I was looking for. The more, the more premium, the bigger the move that's expected in the options market, okay? More premium doesn't have to translate to a bigger move. That's very, very important. More premium doesn't have to translate into a big move. But what it does translate to is an expectation by the market for a big move. Okay, so that right away is going to be the first 
example, or excuse me, the first indication is how much premium is there? If there's a lot of premium baked into the stock, uh, excuse me, baked into the options, then the bigger the move the market is expecting by the stock. If there is not a lot of premium baked into the stock, then the smaller the move the market is expecting. Now, what are the implications of something like this? Okay, well, if the market expects a big move, but a big move does not happen, what's going to happen to that premium? sucked out. It's going to crash. The value of the premium is going to deteriorate very, very quickly. And that's how you can lose your ass overnight, like Chalk says. So it's very important to be aware of the premium, okay? Because that's going to help you formulate your bias, and that's going to help with your expectation. And then if something goes wrong, now that's how you're going to formulate a plan for dealing with that kind of curveball. If there's a lot of premium baked in and a big move doesn't happen, now you have to adjust. Okay, So that's one of the implications. That would be the negative. What would happen if there isn't a lot of premium baked in and the stock makes a big move? How is that going to affect the options? Right, you'll get a huge move, okay? And as far as understanding premium and, and what it is, okay, this is a must-watch video that will explain how much premium is truly baked in on a stock and, and what premium is exactly, okay? So I'm not going to necessarily take the time to premium right now because I've, I've explained it before and it's on YouTube for your viewing knowledge. All right. So now here's where things can get very tricky and interesting, really. To me, it's not the call or put premium that is going to help formulate the as bullish or bearish but it is the open interest and contract volume, okay? Open interest is how many contracts have been opened. So, for instance, we know that when you want to buy a contract, you quote-unquote buy to open, right? And then you sell to close. So if you bought the QQQ 68 strike calls for 60 cents, you would buy to open, and the total volume would rise, and then tomorrow you would see the open interest increase. Okay, The total volume are the contracts traded today. The open interest is the amount of contracts that have either been, that have been bought to open or sold to open. Now this is where it gets confusing. Well, let me ask you guys. If open interest can be is a combination of total contracts bought to open and sold to open, what might be misleading about these open interest figures? For instance, the 69 strike on QQQ has 14,000 contracts open interest. So what might be misleading about this open interest figure? Because the simple, the, the first theory would be, oh wow, 14,000 contracts in open interest on a 69 strike, that's bullish because there's so many people betting on 69, right? There's no other strike that has an open interest that high. But why might that be misleading? Right. There's all you guys are, are saying all valid points. There could be people selling to open them. They could be getting in 
and then sold to someone who's selling them to open them, like, like Amen is saying, okay? So it can be very misleading. Uh, there, it could simply be hedging, okay? You could have maybe somebody short, maybe somebody short QQQ going into, going into Friday with Bernanke, and maybe they're hedging it by taking a, you know, low-priced strike call at 12 cents in case QQQ rips up towards 70. You know, they want to hedge that short position. So there's just, there can just be a lot of confusion when you try and decipher open interest, okay? So personally, it's not something I do, really. I, I just trade the stock and, and trade it based on that. People who really get good at, at deciphering open interest and the total volume and formulating biases that way, I would assume that those types of people are generally doing more swing trading. Um, that would just be my opinion. So, you know, it's, it's hard to have a bias based on, on those types of things because it's really subjective. I can tell you that no, those, how do we know it's not bought to open? You can tell me, uh, excuse me, I can tell you how do we know it wasn't uh, sold to open. You can tell me, you know, oh, they were bought to open. We can go back and forth. There might be data that tells you specifically how many were bought to open and how many were sold to open. But I doubt that the crooks in charge would provide us with that much information. Okay. So in general, though, you do want to pay attention to you know, the total volume and just see which strikes are the most active. And then just see see how the stock reacts in accordance to that. You know, if QQQ or, or on, uh, on SPY, for instance, sometimes what you'll see is there'll be kind of a floor underneath certain strikes or a ceiling just above certain strikes on the, on the call side because there's so much open interest that some fund has a vested interest in making sure those strikes don't get in the money. Why is that? Well, if they are shorting them, if they are selling to open them, and those strikes go in the money, that fund's going to get squeezed. Okay? Or if, or if uh, they're long the calls and they want them to stay in the money, you know, you might you might see some support there because those funds have a vested interest in, in keeping those options in the money. There's all types of things, and again, that's why it's so subjective and it really comes more with experience because it's you just don't know. You can make assumptions, but you just don't know. Next question. How long before you became successful as a trader and how much capital did you begin with? Well, the first thing I'll say is I, I don't think I don't think I'm successful as a trader. I think I've reached a certain level of success, and it's in line with the "Don't let the size of your portfolio dictate how you trade" quote. I have another one I like, and that is "Money doesn't measure success; success measures money." Okay, I don't. I, I would assume a lot of you probably judge your success as a trader by the portfolio, and you know, are you making money or not? And again, this is all about your mindset. To me, that is absolutely the worst possible thing you could do to yourself. Okay, you. We we have a good article called, uh, uh, it's in our trading university that talks about the importance of making good trades but not necessarily making money and how I have made good trades that have lost me money. And those types of trades are trades that were formulated on a sound plan, a solid expectation, a realistic expectation, and it just didn't work out. I had a stop loss. I got stopped out. I lost money, but I still made a good trade in my eyes. Some of you might not be able to, you know, agree with that. And 
you know, I'm really sorry because I think it's it's very important to be open-minded in that regard and able to really advance yourself. Okay, so that's that's the first step as far as that first part of the question. Um, but I started with uh, seven thousand dollars and you know bounced around below three thousand you know, above 10,000, back and forth. I probably went sideways in my portfolio for about 18 months, I would say. And, you know, that, that was that. And then, but once I, once, I, I will say, I don't know why, but I never was inhibited by the pattern day trading thing. I, I, Maybe it's because I wasn't really in a chat room all the time, and I didn't—I wasn't—I wasn't that aware of of how big of a deal it was or whatever. Um, that's irrelevant to me, pennies. Um, you know, I, I wasn't so aware that it was such a big deal to not have twenty-five thousand to be able to trade. My account got restricted all the time, all the time. I would always get restricted for pattern day trading. So what I would do is I would take out my money and I would open a new account. It was pretty simple. Or I'd call them and I would, you know, just beg and say it won't happen again. Um, so, and then also what you guys should know is when I first started trading options, um, I didn't, I, I, I blew up my account pretty decently. Um, and now that, that was a great learning experience for me. And you know now I I think I'm a I'm a solid options trader. I need to get better at a lot of things as we all do. And um, yeah, but you know, being a successful trader isn't about isn't about how much money you're making. Yes, blew up in a negative way. Um, there's a lot of you that I've spoken to some of the other moderators about, and just some of the other people about, and I, I honestly, yeah, you can ask people like James, I say, this kid's going to be a great fucking trader. It's like, he doesn't even know it yet. And that's because some of you still haven't realized that it's not about the money. It's really, really not. I mean, it's a lot like women. It's not always about the looks, guys. It's not how your portfolio looks. Are you having real experiences that you're really learning from? All right. Anybody could have bought SNPK at 30 cents, sunk in 100K, and turned that shit into 200K. That's not very impressive to me. All right, I want to know what have you really learned as a trader. So, oh, and just so you guys know, actively as a trader. I don't like answering this, but I will. I've only been trading full time at this level for four years, but as a child, I was always extremely interested in the market. Um, and the concept of stocks and trading was explained to me when I was probably five or six years old. And I remember being very little, 11, 12, 13, going on AOL Finance and checking the price of, of of stocks like Tyco, Petco, um, you know, just weird things like that, which is why I encourage people now who might have friends that are interested but don't know where to start. It's literally as simple as getting on Yahoo Finance and looking at a stock, okay? Just look at the price of it because if you're, if you're 15, 16, 17, 19, you know, below 22, Going on Yahoo Finance and looking at the price of Apple just once a day every day is more than 95% of everybody else in the world is doing. So just keep that in mind for yourself. Even if you can't be around the market, there's little things you can do to stay in tune. I'm going to be out of town uh, this Thursday for two weeks. But I'm not just going to block out the market. I'll be checking from my phone. I'll just I'll be checking up on prices, you know, so that when I come back, I'm still in touch. I'm still in tune. And to me, that's being a successful trader. All right, knowing that I'm comfortable enough to go out of town. 
I don't feel an extreme need to make money for these two weeks, but I'll I'll go out of town, I'll check prices, you know, and when I come back, I'll, I'll be in a good mindset. To me, that's just as much about being a successful trader as if I was here for two weeks trading every day, making money or losing money. It's all your perception, guys. Hard work is perception. Results is reality. Okay? You and I can do the exact same thing with the same amount of effort. For you, you can tell me you're working extremely hard. Myself, I could tell you it's easy. We could end up with very, very different results. Okay? So that's like why I'm saying looking at a price every day Maybe for you that's hard work, all right? But the results is what's real. Next question. Is it possible for a trader to be successful using only support and resistance as their only strategy? Well, there's just the problem with this question is I don't, you're not really telling me what the strategy is as far as support and resistance. Um, you know, are you buying at support, selling at resistance? Are you are you sell are you shorting breakdowns below support? Are you shorting near resistance? You know, there you just point out a fundamental aspect of technical trading, and you know, just kind of ask if that's successful strategy. That in itself can be the groundwork for a strategy, but I don't really hear a question about an actual strategy here. Okay. Now with that said, understanding support and resistance is very, very, very important. Okay. So use watch this video, all right? And that that's definitely a must watch video. And also as Alfred says about using Bollinger bands and moving averages I don't use anything except volume and price action. The reason is simple. Every other indicator, I don't care what it is, is based on two things. Volume or price action. Moving averages are based on previous prices. MACDs are based on, you know, price how quickly prices rise, okay? RSI, same thing. Fibonacci retracements, those are based on historical prices, okay? You are best off understanding price and volume. Great example on SPY today. And I, you guys know I, I, I don't bullshit. I called this out in chat yesterday, okay, here's a five-minute chart of the last two days on SPY. Who was in the big board room today when I made a comment in regards to this opening volume yesterday on SPY within the first five minutes? You remember what I said, uh, SC? And why? Now, why did I pick this five minute interval on SPY from yesterday as opposed to maybe this five minute interval or, or this five minute interval down here? Right, the highest volume, and we discussed in our last class why it's important when you're coming up with your reference points to choose the areas at which the, the most volume trades. Now, this is neat. If you look. So, just quite simply, one of the things I had on my charts today is I, coming into, the, coming into today, I put my channel lines right here for what we just discussed. This was 
the highest volume of the day yesterday in a five minute interval and that's so that to me is the best reflection of price now we broke below this level you know yesterday really kind of struggled to move above it midday yesterday drifted found support there and then you know came below it and then look at today I mean this this guys is really really telling every time it tried to move back above that level we could not sustain it, okay? So a strategy would be as we rally into this level, I short, which I was doing, okay? And I cover as we fall back below it. Now, where would I be covering? Where, where did I put my other channel, you're wondering? Any guesses? No, I didn't put it at yesterday's low. We gap below yesterday's low. Or let me put it like this. Where am I going to have it going into tomorrow? That's easier. No chalk. The first place you would look if you were gapping below yesterday's low is the pre-market low. I know you. That's the first place you would look. Yes. Highest volume from today, and that is down here in this range from 140.97 up to 140.20. What was it? 141.30. Okay. Right away. Simple strategy, guys. So we gap down. I see this establish itself. First 30 minutes, there's no law that says I have to trade within the first 30 minutes. I've got my reference point on the short side. I've got my reference point on the long side. In between here is no man's land. All right. And just look at this. Bounces kept finding support, you know, and even here on this 14150, then you could have, you know, noted that as well. Well, now for tomorrow, I have a great setup. I have a great setup. I'm going to go long in this channel using this as my stop, as my reference point for a stop. Okay. I'm going to short the breakdown below it. Those are my two options because right now my expectation is that we will bounce out of this channel. However, if we break below it, my expectation is going to change. I'll now expect further downside. All right. As we approach this channel, I will expect resistance. I'll expect supply to outweigh demand, so I'm going to short. If we were to break above this channel, my expectation will change and I would target upside. All right. So right away, took me five minutes. I've got I've got two separate scenarios of expectations here. And now that's the positive and the negative. And of course the neutral is if we just drift sideways, what am I going to do? I'm just going to play the channel. Or maybe I won't play at all because maybe the range will be too tight. Uh, GDP. Here, here's a good question. How will GDP report change those expectations? Anybody have a guess what my answer is with that? Yeah, I don't, I don't give a damn what the GDP report is. It's not going to affect my expectations at all. The, there's only two things that affect my expectations. Only two volume and price action. Those are the only two things that affect my expectations. All right. I don't care if God himself shows up and blesses this market and says we're going to 1600. Unless it starts breaking above 142, I'm going to call his bluff and I'm going to short the damn thing. All right. Volume and price action. Get that through your heads. Your life will be much easier if you just focus on volume and price action.
Okay, next question. Can you explain what causes some options to go insanely high on expiration day? I thought if you hold an option through expiration, they expire worthless. Well, remember what we talked about earlier in terms of premium, okay? On expiration day, do we expect there to be a lot of premium or a little premium baked into the option? Yes, very little. Good, we all agree. All right. And the reason is because there's very, very little time. Okay. And without a lot of time to pass, there isn't going to be a lot of premium. Because the main event that causes premium is time. Of course, when you have earnings, that can change things or, you know, a big event like maybe Bernanke speaking, you'll have more premium because there'll be more expected volatility, etc. So, when there's very little premium, the price of the contract is going uh, true or false. When there's very little premium, the price of the con of an in the money contract okay, in the money contract is going to more accurately, is going to move more in relation to the price of the underlying stock itself. Okay. True or false? This is kind of a trick question. When there is very little premium on an out of the money option on expiration day, the price of that option is going to move very accurately in relation to the price of the stock itself. Yes, it's false. And the reason is in my question itself, how can an out of the money option have very, very little premium on expiration day? Okay, expiration day on it means that expiration is hours away. If you're playing out of the money options, you're paying premium no matter what. Okay, now let's. Th this is going to be a tougher question to answer right now because we don't have such great examples since it's not expiration Friday. On one of these Fridays, we will have to show a live feed of an option chain. But let's pretend, okay? Let's pretend it's a Friday. You have SPY at 141.53. All right. This is going to be hard. I, I don't even want to go there. This is just going to confuse people if I, if I make up an example that isn't there, okay? We'll just have to wait until until a Friday comes around. But in word terms, I'll explain this. Say you have expiration coming up in an hour, right? It, it's 3 p.m. on a Friday, and you're sitting at 2.42.50, okay? All right, you've got 240 call strike going for, say, $2.65, only 15 cents in premium. You've got the 245 call strike going for 15 cents. Which of these call strikes, using this example, is cheaper in terms of premium. The 240 call strike or the 245? Very good. Yes, this is correct. In terms of premium, the 240 call strike is much cheaper. Now, 
if Amazon over the last hour of the day Amazon rallies to 246. We'd expect the 240 call to go from 265 to what? Pennies, shut up, all right? Um, and again, this is harder because we're just, we're making up an example on expiration Friday. We're assuming a lot of things, but this is still good. Uh, anybody who said anything other than $6, oh, week, I understand why you said 665. It's because I have 265 in there instead of just 250. But anybody, okay, for instance, 865, trade one. Remember, we're, we're coming, there's very, very little premium on the in-the-money 240 strike. So anybody who said something other than $6 or thereabouts, why are, how are you coming up with that? Remember, very little premium, only 15 cents in premium here at 3 p.m. on a Friday. I'm going to say about 6 Oh, and first of all, we have to remember what we're actually paying for here. Amazon at 242.50 at 3 p.m. on an expiration Friday, going the 240 strike going for two dollars and sixty-five cents. What that says is you are paying two dollars and sixty-five cents for the right to own Amazon shares at two hundred and forty dollars at the close on Friday. Okay? What this 245 strike is saying, you are paying 15 cents for the right to own Amazon shares at 245. Okay? Now, with an hour to go before expiration Friday, who the hell wants to own the right to buy Amazon at 245 when you could just go on the open market and buy it at 242.50. What type of sense does that make? You'd be going to the weekend automatically down $2.50. So that's why if it doesn't ever move above 245, these are going to expire worthless. Okay? So that's important to understand in terms of what might cause these to, to rally. So here we go. Amazon rallies to 246. We'd expect the 240 call to go from 265 to about six dollars because there's very little premium. And the price at which people are paying for the right to own it at 240 is going to adjust due to the fact that it rallied to 246. And if you watch that video that I linked in, this one right here, very, very important to understand this concept. If you don't explain, if you don't understand what I'm explaining right now, watch this video first, watch class tonight, and this will make a lot more sense, I promise you. All right, now let's get to the fun part about this. So Amazon rallies to 246. We'd expect the 245 call to go from 15 to what? Yes, one dollar. About and one dollar. Now, for the real, for the for the real test of knowledge, why, 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 why would that happen? If it goes to two forty six, why is the two forty five strike call going to go from fifteen cents to one dollar on expiration Friday? It's, it's going to follow the price of the stock. Now it has actual value, but public, why does it have actual value?
Yes, Allie. Allie M coming through. Because now, because now it makes sense to pay for the right to own it at 245. Remember, below 245 on expiration Friday, it doesn't make sense to pay for the right to own Amazon at 245. All of a sudden, we get above 245 on expiration Friday. Now we're now it makes sense. Okay. Obviously, from 265 to six dollars is over 100 percent. Okay. In returns. But from 15 cents down, uh, from 15 cents up to a dollar is over 500 percent. Okay. Now, if Amazon rallied to 246, that would be a 1.4 percent move. Okay. So maybe, first of all, 1.4 percent is that a, is that a realistic move? Some of you that watch Amazon, I mean, could you see something like that happening? Yeah, I could too. I, I easily, easily. Okay. I mean, if if you watch Amazon for a week or two, you'll you'll see that it that shit can go crazy sometimes. Just today, it went from two forty three to like two forty seven or or uh, two forty six seventies or so, somewhere right around there. Okay. So yeah, it's very realistic for a stock like Amazon to do that. All right. Now, so that's what can cause. So, to put it simply, what can cause some options to go insanely high in expiration day? They go from worthless to having value i.e. out of the money to in the money with very little time expiration because now the market needs to adjust at 242.50 at 3 p.m. the market's not concerned with these 245 call strikes but now we start rallying now the market needs to adjust and re really what could happen is Maybe Amazon rallies only to 244.50, but it does so between 3 p.m. and 3.23 p.m., okay? Would we expect these 245 call strikes to move, to gain value? Yes. I would too. I would too. Uh, certainly not up to a dollar or whatever, like it would if it hit 246. But you, you know, you, you could certainly get that. Now, we're talking about all the fun stuff, all the cool stuff. Let's talk about the not so cool stuff on expiration Friday. Say Amazon does rally to 244.50 between that time, and these the 245 call strike now goes to 27 cents just throwing a number out there you buy it at 324 p.m. with Amazon at 244.50 Amazon then from that point in the day through 330 a span of only seven minutes drops to 230, uh, 243, okay, what do we expect from our 245 calls? I mean, we don't know exactly what, because again, we're just calling out numbers here, we're just, but they are going to plummet in value. You they will go back to 15 just as quickly as they went to 27. So you have to be extremely careful on expiration Friday playing out of the money options. Okay? Now, the benefit of going in the money with the 240 strikes is what? Say if Amazon rallies, you know, and then pulls back. What's the benefit of the 240 call strikes? 
as opposed to the 245 call strikes. Less risk, yes. Big Bob said what I was looking for. They're still in the money, therefore they still hold value because even if even if they expire, they're still in the money. So you know, they're still above 240, hopefully, right? In this scenario, so they're not going to be worthless. And if you have the money, you can just exercise the options and take the shares into the next week. That's the way institutions think. That's the way funds think. Okay. All right. So good stuff. That, that was a great question. I'm going to jump to this since it's on the topic of premiums. How can you tell if premiums on an option are too expensive? Again, very, very subjective question requires a very subjective answer. What's expensive? If you go and spend $20 on a new shirt, I might think it's expensive. You might not. If I go and spend $1,000 on a new coat, you might think it's expensive. I might not. Okay? What is expensive? Too expensive is, is whatever the hell you choose too expensive to be. Okay? So, you know, this, this is really on you. All right? And, and this, again, is why I recommend learning about yourself as a trader because you might buy something not thinking the premium's too expensive, like I know a lot of you did on Salesforce, and you might lose your ass, and you might come away saying, you know what, I paid too much in premium. That is why it is so important to what your trades. It is so important to your trades. Because maybe you'll lose money because the pr you pay too much in premium, but you don't even realize it until you review your trades. You might look back and you might think, damn, I paid a lot in premium. That's too expensive. I'm not paying that much again. Right? Okay? So how can you tell if premiums on an option are too expensive? You tell. <laughs> I can't really tell you how you can tell. You can tell me if they're too expensive based on how you feel about them. You know, if, if again, it it comes down to expectations. Okay, if if you only expect the stock, if you come up with a plan based on a stock moving two two percent, two to three percent, and then you go to implement that that plan by way of options, and you when calculating your premium see that the options market is pricing in a five to seven percent move. You have to do one of two things. You have to say, you know what? That's not in line with my expectations. That's too expensive. I'm staying away. Or you have to say, okay, market's expecting something else. Maybe I need to look a little closer. Am I missing something? Maybe I need to change my expectations. My personal preference would be that, you know, I'm I'm typically going to stay with an expectation based on my plan, which is going to be based on price and volume. I'm not going to let premium scare me into doing something. Or, or tempt me into doing something. Maybe premium is so low, maybe premium is so low, so much lower than I expected it to be, that I'm like, oh man, this is awesome. I'm getting a steal. No, I'm not going to play that game. I'm not going to let premium mind fuck me. All right? It's going to be based on my expectations, which is why this type of question is so subjective. And once you come up with those expectations and maybe you make some money, you lose some money, you better review your trades because that is the only way you're going to find out if your subjective analysis is actually objective analysis. Trading is cool because you can be subjective and objective at the same time. You just have to figure out how good you are at being subjective, if that makes sense. All right.
Here's the spy chart. Somebody wanted to see it. I'll leave it up for a second. Okay. Here's another one that's kind of subjective, but I can elaborate a little bit more because I have some personal experience. Can you discuss a good strategy for chasing options with wide spreads when there is real upside downside momentum, such as on Priceline or Chipotle? Well, first of all, we have to be aware of what's going to cause a wide spread. What's going to cause a widespread in an options in an options bid and ask? Right, stock price. Not necessarily lost liquidity. It's not always true. It can be true. But what's the bid and the ask of the stock itself? Think about Priceline and Chipotle, guys. For those of you who who watch it, Salesforce is another one that and Amazon, for, for example, and Google also. They can get kind of wider spreads. But Priceline and Chipotle, by far, out of the high-priced options I play, have the widest spreads. Uh, and you can, you, it can be really, really chick, uh, tricky sometimes because of those spreads. So, and again, with that said, you have to be aware of, of the spreads being so wide because if, if there's an option going for 130 by 180 and you know you you buy it at 180 and then it went down and now it's now it's 110 by 160 and you have to sell to the bid a 50% loss right off the bat you know and, and and so you have to be careful. So strategy for chasing options with wide spreads is real upside downside momentum. Laker hinted at it a little bit. In order to first talk about this strategy, we have to identify when there's real upside downside momentum. What's going to be our first clue that stocks like Priceline and Chipotle might have more momentum than usual? What's yeah, Yes, volume, perfect, perfect. Okay, so the fur, the the biggest key with this, guys. I'll put an asterisk next to it because it is so important. Identifying above average opening volume, opening volume. Why am I saying opening volume and not just you know midday volume? Why opening volume? It can be the highest volume. A lot of people do trade, but I, I'm looking for something more specific. Yes, Stockhawk, exactly right. Exactly right. Because the opening volume is the best indication of the interest in that stock for the entire day. That's the answer I like the best. You guys all said, you know, good things, but in regards to this specific strategy, chasing, chasing spreads, okay, it's the opening volume that's going to be so important because that is your best indication of the interest for that day. If the opening volume is, is very, very high, then the volume throughout that day is likely to remain high, which means we've got more liquidity, which could result, like Laker pointed out, closer spreads, which can result in a good environment to chase, especially on stocks like Priceline and Chipotle. Okay, so identifying above average opening volume is the key off the bat. And again, this, this falls in line with sense of awareness. If you're gonna, if you're going to implement, I don't know how to spell, 
Ah, uh, yes. If you're going to implement different types of strategies, like the one above, you have to know the different types of things you must be aware about, you must be aware of, okay, such as identifying above average opening volume. Now, as for a strategy for, for chasing them, you know, this is going to be where the subjective nature of trading comes in. If you see that opening volume, you might, you, you might say, I'm going to buy the dip, all right? I'm going to buy the first dip. Buying the first dip, no matter what, first dip, I'm hitting the ask, all right? Or you might just chase it right away, and you might say, as soon as volume, as soon as volume dries up, you know, as soon as the three-minute volume candle is lower than the previous three-minute volume candle, I'm getting out, okay? Or... If we break above this point on volume on a three-minute chart greater than the previous three-minute candle, I'm going to hit the ask. I'm going to put my sale up for, you know, 30 cents above. When I traded Priceline, and I don't anymore because I just wasn't that good at it, to be honest. Some of you might be, though, and if you are, you, you should stick with it because remember what I say, ignore your weaknesses. Be aware of them, but ignore them, and just enhance your strengths. So if you find this is a strategy you're good at, by all means, go for it. If you struggle with it, though, my advice would be do not try to improve it. Be aware that you're not good at it, and simply ignore it. Stay away from using it. But when I was playing Priceline, because it does have ridiculously wide spreads. I mean, a typical spread on Priceline would be 150 by 190, all right? So if I was going to chase, I'd buy it, I'd buy the 190 immediately. Next class we'll have a uh, spelling bee competition. And then immediately I'd put my sell order in at 220 for instance. Because other people are doing the same thing as me, they're chasing the ask, right? If I'm doing it and I have confidence in my trading style, then other people are probably doing it too. All the cool kids are doing it, right? So, um, and what that does is then when the spread starts to jump, now your order is in already and, and the spread kind of works in your favor. You want to use a strategy that's going to have the spread working for you in your favor, all right? So... What I mean by that is avoid situa avoid putting yourselves avoid putting yourself in a situation where you have to sell into the bid because it's not like Apple where the spread is nice and tight. It's not like Spy where it's nice and tight and you can sell into the bid and get out like that. No, it doesn't work like that. So avoid putting yourself in a situation where you have to sell into the bid. What type of situation might that be? Well. Volume and price action stopping. Okay, so in other words, do not wait for volume and price action to stop when playing stocks, excuse me, options on a name like Priceline. All right, and what I mean by that is if we're playing Apple or we're playing uh, Spy, um, you can, a lot of times, you can adjust very quickly because you can watch volume and price and you can say, okay, volume, price, action, stopping here. I just got my reference point. I'm going to get out if it goes below this area, price, action, stopped, and you'll have no problem selling into the bid. But if you wait until that point on a stock like Priceline, by the time it's breaking below your reference point, because of the nature of the spreads, it's already going to have dropped 20 to 30%. Yeah, it's, yeah, just like you say, it's a lot like playing penny stocks. Don't wait till the dump occurs to try and start selling your shares. All right? Sell on the way up, right? So hopefully that uh, gives you some good answers and insight into that. But the number one thing I would say, and I, I wish I had more situations to recall, but I just don't have that much experience, 
is avoid putting yourself in a situation where you have to sell into the bid. And again, review your trades. If you lose money using this strategy, go back and look. You might find that you put yourself in a situation you didn't even realize at the time. By reviewing your trades, you will become more aware. Awareness is nothing but a positive to have as a trader. It's nothing but a positive characteristic to have as a trader, being aware. All right, good stuff. I enjoyed the options stuff today. It's nice, nice to see people maybe maturing a little bit uh, with their questions. Nice to see we're not moving all on penny stocks. And that's good because, quite frankly, guys, the liquidity just isn't there in the penny market. So I'm glad to see people are adjusting. If there's not liquidity, you can't play. All right. Chart session is going to be a little rushed because uh, the questions were, were so good and so in detail, and I have a dinner at uh, 6 o'clock. Okay, so I apologize in advance for that in regards to charts. NAVB, mm, a lot, a lot of volume traded up here in this 436 to 466, and then you had a ton of volume trade here. So, again, just like I showed on the five-minute chart with SPY, if you just kind of take this, you can see it's really struggling. Let's see it sustain above $4. I want to see some back-to-back -back closes above 4 bucks. If we can do that, we can talk about these highs, the 420 range, and then you know possibly 450. But NAVB, I just kind of be watching. <coughs> Excuse me. I would just be watching until I saw it close above $4. And I'd be using this low here at 360 as maybe a risk-reward entry point. If it pulled back towards 360, I could get in here and initiate uh, position with a stop at 360. So 360 to 4 is kind of wh what I see right here that will really determine the next move. I love anytime somebody requests my favorite stock and that's Lulu. Okay. Today's candle is very weird. That doesn't seem right. Let's go to stock charts. Yes, I don't know what's going on with E-Trade Pro. But Lulu, you can see this gap down here from 70 down to 65. So we're at a real key level. All right. What I will say, though, is look at this bounce right here from August 1st. Just tremendous performance from about the 52.50 level up to 65. So that's Lulu's up over 20% since August 1st. That's just a hell of a move. However, we're still 15 points off the all-time high of 80. So we're about 20 points off of 80. So technically, we're, we're closer to the low than we are to the high. On a net-net basis, I would think that's bearish. Just overall, you know, it's better to be, if you're in the stock, you know, you'd like to see it getting closer to the high. But from a weekly perspective, if you look at Lulu over the last few years, you can see that it's just been on a monstrous run from 15 and I think even 5 bucks up to 80 and now it's pulled back. And if you look at this range here, you've got $40 to $80 kind of from the, the low in 20, 2011 during the crash. Last fall was around 40 bucks, rallied up to 80 and you know you're putting in a higher low and this higher low is kind of coming in stride with where this all-time high was between 55 and 65. So overall, we're seeing previous resistance turn into new support, which is good. So I'd like to see it now stay above 60. Okay, And I do expect it to struggle a little bit with this gap down. I, there's definitely going to be some supply here between 65 and 70. Not a bad short, but I'd rather short it closer to 70, okay? 
a little bit of an inverse head and shoulders here. Got the left shoulder, got the head, got the right shoulder. Okay, maybe you've got the left shoulder here, head, right shoulder, but definitely got something going on. Volume pattern, eh. I mean, nothing too exciting. Let's look at the intraday chart from a day trading perspective on the name. Let's look at the 15 minute, since we've had quite a big run. Actually, we'll go 60 minute. So here you've got really high volume on this spike right here. And really here too, these back-to-back -back candles. So this range is, is where I'd watch Lulu on pullbacks, 62.30 to 64.40. I'd look at going long down here, okay? And if it can't hold this level, your next major volume spike is this range here between 60.45 and 60.89. Below that, your next one is here between 57.14 and 58.06. Always identify volume spikes and identify the price ranges. FRCN. Why are all my charts doing that? It's annoying. Okay. So what I like about FRCN is the liquidity spike the last few days. Granted, it's not that great in terms of dollar volume. But relative to the, relative to the stock itself, the volume is, is the best it's ever been. And why do we like that? Why do we like that, guys? Well, Chalk already said one, volume gives you the best pivots. Well, price doesn't always follow volume, but what, what does tend to follow volume? Traders. Traders follow volume. Like Take Note said, they can get in and out. And like Penny said, at least there's some action. There's some interest. All right? There's some money flowing through there relative to before. So price doesn't always follow volume. That's, that's not true. But if volume is picking up, that means there's more liquidity. That means people like me who wouldn't usually play these really cheap stocks, now our eyes kind of light up. We're like, well, man, if it gets even more liquid, I could go in there with like 15 grand and, and make 10% and I'm done for the day. All right. That's why even though PRTN wasn't that exciting today, it was still good because it still has liquidity. People with size can still go in there and know that they can get out rather easily. So you, you just got to watch FRCN. That's all. We just got to watch it to see if, if this liquidity keeps up. SOMX. God. SOMX, I can tell you right now, I didn't really like the volume pattern. I remember looking at this one today. Okay, so I, I don't like the volume pattern. What does this volume spike up here mean between 40 and 62.5? What, what don't we like about that type of shit? Yeah, dilution, but what else don't we? Ag holders, dun, dun, dun. Okay. Bag holder central, all right? And what that means from a supply and demand perspective is what? Well, it means... There's a lot, there was a lot of demand on this day that since the price dropped, any rallies toward that price, what do we expect that previous demand to become? Yes, future supply. All right. So SOMX, what I like is you've got some reference points here at 27.5 as support, and you've got resistance at 32.5. What I don't like is the overall volume pattern. NTE. Okay, that's just a fucking monster. All right. Be afraid. Be very afraid because this is not healthy. This is like when your friend starts a weight loss program and he loses like 100 pounds in four days. It's like, I'm proud for you, bro, but maybe you should start eating normally again. 
all right? The stock is not eating normally. That's, yeah, be careful. <laughs> Let's look at the intraday chart, see what we got going on here. Try and get some reference points. All right, so major liquidity spike at the open today. So first reference point is going to be today's opening five-minute range, 887 to 913. And then you had another spike, 894 to 907. So this, this is really good because you've got major volume that traded in this range right here. Your next major volume spikes came up here towards the close. So it needs to extend above $10 on five-minute volume greater than 120,000 shares for me to even think about scalping it towards 1020 to 1050. All right, let's go back even more. God, somebody got paid, guys. Look at that. All that volume traded around $6, and it's all coming out up here. Good for them. Lucky SOBs. So yeah, that 880 to 915 range, watch that on pullbacks. Below that, though, it could crack pretty hard down back towards where this volume started coming in around $8. It's got to be at all-time highs. Oh, no. Nope. Two hundred day highs, two year highs, three year highs, four year highs. So not five year highs. Look at this. Look at this weekly chart. Eight fifteen to ten fifteen. Ton of volume traded back in LA. Break above ten fifteen. Not much volume for a reference point, you know, you just would have to play at 1050, 1075, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I'd be, this would be a good example of a stock I would be short biased on. But with that said, I still wouldn't, even though I'd be short biased, I, I would, I stay away from these because Alfred, tell me reference point. Yeah, I don't, I mean, you can find one, but it's it's not a reference point I'm very comfortable with, okay? I, I don't feel good about it. But the daily chart, the, the intraday chart, I'm sorry, shows me that there's good consistent liquidity for day trading. So by all means, day trade that sucker, but just, you know, be careful. Not for the inexperienced. Last one, NAC. Why do I know this ticker? Okay. NAC, eh, don't like this chart. Need to break above three bucks. But again, the problem with breaking above three is we have all this volume trapped all the way from 250 to 382. Okay, so there's just a lot of bag holders, guys. A lot of bag holders. And while the volume is greater, it's not it's not greater than all this volume here in, in 2010 and 2011. I mean, this looks like something that will slowly just drift down to zero. Unless you get a monster liquidity spike. I'm talking uh, millions and millions of shares trade in one day. You know, over over 3 million shares trade in one day, that, that would maybe put it back on the map. Let's get a reference point from our intraday chart. It is relatively liquid, though, for a, for a small cap. So this low here, 283, and this low here at 280. All right, 280, let's just say 280 to 285 key support. Resistance, $3. All right, guys, that's all. Good stuff, good questions. Everybody have a good night. Thanks for joining, and this will be posted uh, later.